World War II was fought from 1939 to 1945, and the United States was involved from 1941 to 1945, following the December 7, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. The war was fought on two fronts, the European front and the Pacific front, but there was also involvement at home, as American consumers made sacrifices to help the war effort. This was best exemplified by rationing and scrap drives. Automobile tires were the first consumer goods taken off the market. As Japan controlled 97% of the natural rubber production in the world, synthetic rubber had not yet been perfected. The federal government froze the sale of new tires and forbade recapping early in 1942. The armed forces badly needed tires and the national stockpile of natural rubber products was only about 700,000 tons or about one year of consumer consumption. Huge quantities of automobile tires and other rubber products were collected in a scrap drive. One Seattle shoemaker contributed six tons of worn rubber heels from shoes that he had saved and a Los Angeles tire dealer provided 5,000 tons of trade-ins. Many other rubber products were also collected, such as old overshoes and doormats. Gasoline was rationed by the summer of 1942. The total miles a car could be driven was limited by the gallons of gas each category of driver was allotted. Drivers were issued stickers to put on the front windshield of their car, which indicated how much gasoline they could be provided. A stickers were the most common. They were given to ordinary motorists and provided motorists two to four gallons of gasoline per week. B stickers were given to defense workers or those for whom driving was considered a necessity. They received a few more gallons than the A sticker drivers. C stickers were given to physicians and others for whom driving was essential and they were given a few more gallons than the people with B stickers. T stickers were given to truckers who were given unlimited gasoline because of their importance to the war effort. And the X sticker was given to political and social bigwigs and they were also given unlimited gasoline. Counterfeiting and selling gasoline rationing coupons and window stickers, particularly the C stickers, was common. The government agency responsible for rationing and scrap drives, the Office of Price Administration, or the OPA, found that 20 million gallons of gasoline coupons were stolen in Washington, D.C. alone. During the war years, a very common sight became automobiles lined up at gas stations waiting to receive the very limited quantities of gasoline. Other automobile products were also affected by the war. In particular, very few new cars were produced during the war years. And among those new cars, the bumpers, which were made of chromium, were eliminated from the new cars. Chromium was needed for the war effort. And so, in the place of chrome bumpers, wooden bumpers were used during World War II. A national speed limit was also established. President Franklin Roosevelt proclaimed a national speed limit of 35 miles per hour it was usually called war speed or victory speed, and pleasure driving was banned. Officials of the Office of Price Administration, the OPA, wrote down car license numbers at picnics, racetracks, concert halls, and athletic events, and contacted individuals saying that they were not doing their part to aid the war effort. Many local organizations and governments sponsored scrap drives, particularly in 1942 and 1943, that collected important materials for the war effort like iron, steel, brass, bronze, tin, silk stockings, which were used for gunpowder bags, even bacon grease, which was used in munitions manufacturing, and there was also a call for much waste paper. Of these items, scrap iron, steel, tin, and paper were the most useful, and these scrap drives were the most successful. So much paper was collected, in fact, that the nation's paper mills could not keep up with all of this new raw material. Even clothing styles were influenced by the necessities of war. In the spring of 1942, the War Production Board became the nation's premier fashion consultant, dictating styles for civilian clothing that would use fewer resources, thus allowing more cloth and metals to go to the war effort. 
For example, menswear rid itself of vests, elbow patches on jackets, and cuffs on pants. And women's clothing became simplified, with shorter, narrower skirts. The tin shortage led to a rationing of canned goods. In fact, in order to buy canned goods or many other food items, a consumer had to hand the grocer ration stamps from a ration book that was issued to the American consumer. In order to buy food items, a consumer had to hand the grocer ration stamps as well as money. The stamps were issued regularly in books and served as a parallel but essential economy. The amount of stamps you received was determined by your family size and they, they had a time limit. They had to be used within a certain time period. There were exceptions. If you had a specific medical condition, more stamps could be issued after review by a rationing board. In order to buy a product, the consumer had to provide money and a certain value of ration stamp points, as they were called. For example, a pound of butter cost 16 points. Once you were issued a ration book and the stamps, once you were out of those stamps, no more of that item would be available until the next cycle of ration books. The tiny ration stamps, which were color-coded, red stamps meant meat or butter, blue stamps meant processed food, and there were also green and brown stamps, were a pain to process. More than three and a half billion stamps changed hands monthly. The grocery store had to turn in stamps to a wholesaler, who in turn had to deposit them with the bank, who then reported them to the federal government. Coffee was also rationed primarily because ships available to carry coffee from South America were severely limited. When coffee rationing began in November 1942, people began to hoard it. It's understandable, since the amount of coffee you were allowed was one pound of coffee per person every five weeks. As a result, coffee became a very desirable commodity. At restaurants, some diners were given a choice. You could have an extra cup of coffee or dessert, but not both. When rationing of coffee was dropped in July 1943, sales of coffee also dropped. Then there were rumors again of coffee rationing in the fall of 1943. The rumors were false, but because of the rumors, coffee sales skyrocketed and consumers stripped the shelves. When the Office of Price Administration announced the rumors were false, coffee sales dropped again. Cigarettes were also rationed. 30% of the industry's production was reserved for the armed forces, which only represented about 10% of the nation's population. Some historians have argued that the government was, in effect, subsidizing the smoking habit in the armed services. A consequence of wartime shortages and rationing was the popularity of gardening. There was no shortage of fresh vegetables, and they were never rationed. However, transportation limitations made delivery very difficult, so the government encouraged gardening. Approximately 21 million individuals and family planted what were called victory gardens and produced 30 to 40 percent of all vegetables grown in the United States during the war years. After the war, vegetable gardening was associated with wartime shortages and most people brought frozen or canned vegetables as a result, and home gardening ceased to be popular. All of this rationing and scrap drives depended on the American consumers supporting it. Overwhelmingly, the American consumers supported the war effort through rationing and scrap drives, but there were a few who were reluctant to join in. As a result, the federal government sponsored a campaign to encourage those reluctant few to do their part. An example of this campaign is shown here. This is from a Department of Agriculture film produced in 1943 called It's Up to You, Supporting Rationing. The program is supported in this film through the use of song. They heard him in Washington and worked out a system to make the food go around. A plan to see to it that everyone gets an equal share of what there is. That plan is called rationing. So here's a plan that's fair and square. Everybody gets their share. No more griping anywhere. Get the point, Mrs. Brown. One for you and one for me. It's as clear as ABC. Share alike for victory. Get the point. 
point, Mrs. Brown. That's what a rationing plan is for, Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the grocery man or the butcher store. Your share is there with the Kellys and Cones. Equal service in the stores. Fancy pants or cotton drawers. She gets hers and you get yours. Get the point, Mrs. Brown. And so Mrs. Brown and most people want to make rationing work. It's still up to us. And there are an awful lot of people in the world depending on us. They're in Guadalcanal and Iceland and Tunisia. To fight, they need twice as much food as they needed when they were civilians. So do they get that steak or don't they? Because it's a very simple proposition. If we do, they don't. Remember what the farmer said? It's up to you. It's up to you, mister. What do you say? It's up to you, sister. Starting today, if all the soldier boys can win and